I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Okay, our second song, I Stand in Awe, is one that we haven't sung a lot, so we're not real familiar. We're going to sing through a couple of times so we can get more familiar. beyond description to marvelous for words to wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen or heard who can grasp your infinite wisdom can fathom the depth of your love. You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. You are beautiful beyond description. Marvelous for words, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom? the depths of your love. You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, 
Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad that I entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to the fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. In our closing, faith is a victory. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all away, but there's something about that name. But Spirit and Fire, this is something I'm going to be, a series that we're going to be doing, and this morning is just going to be talking about Pentecost, and what is Pentecost, and um, this is probably going to blow some of your all's minds, because when we think of the word Pentecost, a lot of times the first thing that comes to our mind is a Pentecostal faith, or a Pentecostal denomination, or an experience, or something like that. I'm not even going there this morning. You're like, what? I'm not even going there this morning, because I'm taking you to the scriptures to explain to you what Pentecost is. And so this morning is probably going to be a little more of a teaching, probably more than anything. Um, I might get a little preaching in here, and that's okay, but uh, probably more of a teaching than anything, because I want to make sure that as we go toward Pentecost Sunday on June 4th, we really understand what Pentecost Sunday is all about. And I think that's a real important thing for us to be able to do. Um, but if you go to Luke chapter 3 verses 15 through 16 and you also find this same verses of scripture in Matthew 3 11 through 12 and in Mark 1 7 through 8 Jesus says this as he's going to get water baptized by John the Baptist and I think this is some of the most powerful verses of scripture that kind of uh, gives an idea of what Jesus is wanting to do for his church in the future and it says this, it says, the people were waiting expectantly. Hmm, 
<laughs> Don't you just love that? Expectantly. Anybody come to church expecting this morning? If you didn't, you need to go pray. <laughs> That's all I can say. If we don't come to church expecting for God to move, expecting for God to do something, we're in trouble. Because I tell you what, this is a good place for God to show up and show out. Amen. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Father, I just ask this morning as, as uh, we start the first series is going into what Pentecost is and understanding Pentecost and the promises of the Holy Spirit and the things that you've promised your church for today. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would show up in a special way. God, that you would show up, that you would show out, that you would just, God, be yourself. Let your Holy Spirit come and just, just be himself among us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you this morning. We welcome you because you are a promise from the Father. And Lord, we give you glory and we give you honor and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the biggest misconceptions and probably one of the most confusing things about our Christian faith, at least it was when I first got saved, was the various celebrations that we have as, uh, as Christians. You know, we have Christmas, we have Easter, we have, you know, just all kinds of different celebrations that we do throughout the year. Um, you know, even when I came to the church here and I had to learn this myself, you know, it was and it's something as simple as this, it's like the banners that we have on, on uh, the pulpit and, and different things that we have going around here, the tapestries and stuff like that, and the different colors, and what they were stood for and the sim symbolism that they have. Um, because a lot of the churches that I've gone to didn't have those things. That's not right. That's not wrong. But there's all kinds of different things about our Christian faith that we may not understand. And most of us understand Christmas, you know, the birth of Christ, the fact that he was born, the fact that he, you know, he was born of a virgin, the fact that, you know, he was born in Bethlehem and just all the amazing things about Jesus and the birth of Christ. And most of us understand about Easter, the fact that Jesus died for our sins. But one of the things that we a lot of times overlook and we forget about is that Jesus also fulfilled by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit another prophetic thing that was all throughout the Old Testament, and that was Pentecost. Pentecost. See, most Christians have an understanding of these Christmas and Easter, but when it comes to Pentecost, there's some confusion here. See, Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. The Jews actually celebrated Pentecost. Now, they, they called it something different. They called it Shavuot. And in a Greek language, a Greek language, take that word Shavuot and switched it over to the Pentecost. But one of the things that we have got to understand is what is Pentecost? What, what is it? What, what is this thing called Pentecost? You know, we look in the scriptures and we see this, but what is it? Before understanding Pentecost, though, we, meant we need to first understand this progression of prophetic fulfillments of Jesus Christ. And I think this is really important. These prophetic fulfillments are crucial in understanding not just our outcome of our relationship with Jesus Christ, but our outcome in our relationship with Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God today. Because I think these are extremely, extremely important. Not only in understanding the forgiveness of God, not only understanding the healing of God, but even more important, the Holy Spirit that is in our life. And I know those that have come to the Holy Spirit class on, uh, and that's what we've been studying on Sunday nights. We haven't done it this month. I kind of miss, miss y'all. Um, <laughs> but um, we've been studying the Holy Spirit. And we, it's amazing when we don't understand the Holy Spirit, what we may have missed out on our life. Because it's a promise of God. It's something that God had promised to his church. So let's look at some real prophetic fulfillments real quick. And this isn't all of them. It's not all the scripture verses, but it's just a few. But look at the, let's look at the first one that Jesus fulfilled. First one was Christmas. This is otherwise known as the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay, we all know this, but it's a, it's a prophetic fulfillment of our coming Savior. The fact that he was born of a virgin. By Jesus' birth, there were all kinds of prophetic fulfillments. And I can go on and on and on and probably teach you on that for an entire week. And we're not going to do that this morning. But just to name a few, his virgin birth. He was born of a virgin. The place he was born. 
the fact that he was born in Bethlehem, the fact that he was from the tribe of Judah, the fact that he was a descendant of the King David, and the very fact that he lived a sinless life. All are prophetic fulfillments through Jesus Christ. This was before he even went to the cross. And to me, that's pretty amazing. That before even Jesus went to the cross, there's numerous prophetic fulfillments that Jesus fulfilled. Numerous. Then we have the second one, which is Easter. Now we call it Easter, but it's actually a Jewish holiday, Passover. And we know that during Passover, this is a fulfillment of prophecy regarding Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. As he becomes the lamb of God, as he becomes the bread of life, as he becomes the first fruit among all his people. And again, there's numerous, numerous prophetic things regarding the, the you know, Jesus' death on the cross. And I'm not going to go over all of them, so I'm sure you're going to find a ton of them. But, you know, the fact that he was riding on a donkey colt to Jerusalem was a prophetic fulfillment. The fact that he was betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver and the money was used for the purchase of a potter's field was a prophetic fulfillment. God is so detailed. You know, sometimes we wonder if God's listening to us. But you know, when I look at Jesus and the fact how he came and all the extreme details, even 30 pieces of silver, the fact that there was a potter for, potter's field that was purchased and, I, and he was riding a donkey's colt. And I sit and I think about the details, the very details that, Jesus, that God was able to fulfill through Jesus is amazing to me. I had a youth pastor several years ago. She was praying. And she wanted to go to uh, King's Island, which is kind of a place, kind of like Worlds of Fun or Six Flags or something like that. And they didn't have any money. And she was praying one day, and they had four kids, and so they were praying one day and everything. And she's like, but God, you really don't, you don't care about me going to some amusement park, you know. But I'm going to pray it anyway. I'm just going to, you know. So she prayed. And she said, she said God, I, I just, God, you're going to open a door somehow for my entire family to go to the amusement park. And I won't have to pay a thing. My family's never gone. And I really like to take my kids. All of a sudden on the radio, <laughs> there was an advertisement. You'd be the 20th caller and you'll get five tickets. She so happened to be the 20th caller and got those tickets. Now what's the chances of that? See, God knows every little single detail of our life. He knows our heart. He knows what our needs are. And sometimes he wants to even bless you with some tickets to go to Worlds of Fun or to go to Six Flags or whatever it might be because he knows every single detail of our life. And God knew every single detail, every prophetic thing that needed to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. See, the other thing, the, the Messiah would die a sacrificial death next to two criminals. You know, I mean, how can you 2,000 years prior, thousands of years prior, all these prophecies go forth and all of a sudden Jesus is fulfilling all these the fact that he would rise from the dead, a prophetic fulfillment. But Pentecost also is a prophetic fulfillment. We know about Christmas, we know about Easter, but so is Pentecost. See, Pentecost, also known as Shavuot in the, in the Hebrew language, is also known in the Greek language as Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. And this is a fulfillment of prophecy regarding Israel's freedom from enslavement to Egypt, also, the giving of the Torah, and if anybody doesn't know what the Torah is, it's the first five books of the Bible, because there was a time that they didn't have the first five books, and all of a sudden, you know, Moses goes up on the hill, and the Ten Commandments come down, and we all know, most of us know the story of how the Ten Commandments come about, and that's known as the Torah. So it's a celebration of giving of the Word of God, but it's also the celebration of the first fruits or the harvest. So when we think of Pentecost and the celebration of Pentecost, it's about the Word of God and it's about celebration of the harvest coming in. Think about that for a second. The harvest coming in. See, as, and, and all this happens as the Holy Spirit is outpoured through the evidence of wind and fire as He enlightens and empowers believers for an increase in the harvest of souls. Not only that, there were numerous fulfillments of prophecy on the day of Pentecost. And here, just to name a few, these, these were pretty amazing. Uh, fulfillment of John's prophecy about being baptized with the Holy Spirit in fire. And we see this all throughout the Gospels. And then we see it happening in Acts. And we see, you know, Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit's even poured out. And then we see the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to be empowered. You know, I could just imagine... You see, people, people in the Old Testament didn't have the Holy Spirit like we do today. You know, when we get saved, 
And anybody that's been, been in, the, in the class on Sunday nights knows this. We've gone through this, and it's pretty, pretty neat, actually. But, you know, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people as God chose. But, you know, in the New Testament, once we are saved, the Holy Spirit now lives inside of us. And the Bible says, and, and Paul actually wrote this in Romans, he says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? See, the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. Isn't that amazing? Every single one of us. But under the Old Testament, it wasn't like that. And, and Jesus was telling these, I could just imagine these disciples. He's telling them, you're going to go out, and when you preach the gospel, when you go and you call forth the harvest, these miracle signs and wonders are going to follow you. He didn't say they were going to go chasing signs, miracles, wonders. He said, because you are a believer, the signs, miracles, wonders are going to follow you. And I could just imagine these disciples are kind of standing around and thinking, wait a minute, who are we? Because when Jesus was telling them these things, when he was telling his disciples that you're going to go out and do the works that I did and do more works than I do, I can imagine the disciples and everybody else are standing around scratching their heads. How in the world are we going to do this? Because God chooses to whom he wants the Holy Spirit to come upon. Because at that point, none of them had received the Holy Spirit, ever. But when you go to John 21, 22, I believe it's 21, 22. I, we've got this, I think we got this right in class now. In 21, 22, it talks about the fact that Jesus breathes upon the disciple. And this was before Pentecost breathes upon the disciples and they receive the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? That means that once you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. There's some people that teach you otherwise, but that's just not biblically sound. The fact is, is that the moment you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And that is amazing to me. Absolutely amazing to me. So during Pentecost, we see John's prophecy fulfilled. We see the promise of Jesus for the empowerment that's being fulfilled. We see the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh. And there's all kinds of scriptures throughout the Old Testament that talks about all flesh, not just whom God chooses, not just whom, you know, occasionally here and there, but upon all flesh, our sons, our daughters, everybody. We also see the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit being poured out symbolically as wind and fire. And when we go into the Old Testament, we find, you know, even with Ezekiel, you know, he's, or not, I'm, I'm sorry, not Ezekiel, Elijah. When we look at Elijah, how did God try to get his attention? He tried to get him th his attention through wind and earthquake and all kinds of things. We see the burning bush, a bush that was by fire, but the bush never burned up. God was trying to get a hold of the attention of Moses by a burning bush. And so we see wind and fire as symbolic of the Holy Spirit all throughout the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we find this being fulfilled. As evidence, Jesus Christ fulfilled three major events, three major prophetic things. He didn't just fulfill Christmas and Easter. He also fulfilled Pentecost. To me, that's exciting. So, but the question is, is why is it that a lot of times in, in a lot of circles, you know, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Easter, but why do we forget about Pentecost sometimes? Well, you know, when you really think about it, it's really hard for the secular world to materialize Pentecost. Because the only way they can materialize Pentecost is for our churches to be completely filled and people getting saved. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because what happened in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, there was over 3,000 people that got saved. And Peter's first message. To me, that is pretty amazing. And I would love to be, I would love to be under the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I would be able to stand out here on the front steps of this church and get some speakers and preach and the whole entire neighborhood come to Christ. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would just be absolutely amazing. But this is what Pentecost is about. One, one pastor put it this way, to celebrate Christmas and Easter without recognizing Pentecost would be like recognizing one being adopted by a millionaire, but failing to accept their inheritance through their adoption. See, Pentecost is about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You know, some people get caught up in tongues, they get caught up in the gifts, they get caught up in all this, and they miss the purpose. They miss the meaning of Pentecost. And the purpose and meaning of Pentecost is not all that. The purpose and meaning of Pentecost is about being empowered to see this world saved and one of Jesus Christ. That's what Pentecost is all about. So what is Pentecost? Well, Pentecost, I just you know, said a few minutes ago, comes from, the Greek, from a Greek word, which actually is from the Jewish celebration, Shavuot otherwise known as a festival of weeks. The term Pentecost is a Greek word referring to the 50th day, because Pentecost actually means 50, the 50th day after Passover. 
And you find in Leviticus 23, 15 through 16, where God tells the Jewish people they've got to celebrate Shavuot or Pentecost. It's one of the three pilgr pilgrim uh, festivals when Jewish Jews would travel all the way to Jerusalem and they would celebrate. It's this accounting of days and weeks is expressed with a great anticipation as appreciation for what God is doing in their life. Shavuot is a harvest festival celebrating the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. Now to me this is pretty amazing because what does wheat make? It makes bread. Who's the bread of life? Jesus Christ. What is the celebration of Pentecost about? The first fruits of the wheat harvest, the bread of life. Isn't that pretty amazing? That's prophetic. That's a prophetic word right there in itself through the scriptures as, as Jesus is fulfilling Pentecost. We also find that during the celebration of Pentecost, the, the Jews would celebrate by reading the book of Ruth. And, and, and I love the book of Ruth. It's an amazing book. But did you know the book of Ruth is about a harvest story? And they would read the book of Ruth. The Jews would come into to Jerusalem and they would bring in their first fruits of the wheat harvest. And they would celebrate about the word of God and they would read the book of Ruth and they would begin to memorize the Torah because some of them unlike us today who have Bibles five or six in our house <laughs> they didn't have the word of God like that back then sometimes they had to go to the temple and hear the word of God and try to memorize the word of God at that time but they would celebrate the celebrate this celebration with the book of Ruth and talk about the harvest they would celebrate about the freedom from enslavement see Pentecost is about the celebration of freedom it's about the celebration of the Word of God It's the celebration of the first fruits about the harvest coming in that to me is amazing Shavuot represented the annual celebration of the day the nation of Israel entered into the covenant with God and the Torah was given and we found that on Mount Sinai this means the entire nation was present during Shavuot or Pentecost. The whole nation was there. It is by no coincidence the parallels between the giving of the Torah and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's no coincidence of this on the day of Pentecost. If anything, it reinforces the significance of Pentecost as a Christian celebration of entering the new covenant with God and being empowered to do what God has called us to do. See, it's one thing to hold a title, but it's another to be empowered to work within that title. See, God has not left us, you helpless this morning. He's not left you an orphan. And he's not called you to live a life that is holy and pleasing to him. And he's not called you to go out and to win this world without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He's not done it. He's not left you powerless this morning. He's promised the Holy Spirit. And Pentecost is all about the promise of the Holy Spirit coming. So that we can go out and be empowered. Throughout scripture, both Old and the New Testament, is prophesied God would pour out his Holy Spirit upon all flesh. It is no coincidence God chose the Jewish festival of Shavuot to pour out the Holy Spirit. That to me is amazing. How prophetic is that? And you see that in John 16 and 7. As Jesus said, and, and we've talked about this in class too, as Jesus said in John 16 and 7, that it was better for him to go away. And we've, we've talked about this, and I love this. It's hard for me to fathom this, but imagine being a disciple, and you're seeing Jesus walk on water, calm storms, raise the dead, eyes open and everything else, and the Son of God looks at you and says, you know what, it's better that I go away. I could just, I'd be shaking my head like, what in the world do you mean it's better for you to go away? Don't leave me, you know, don't leave me, no. You know, I've seen all these miracles, I need to walk with you. I, and what does Jesus say in, in John 16 and 7? He says, no, it's better that I go away because I want to send to you the comforter, the Holy Spirit, so that you can be empowered. And, and as Jesus went on to say, he says, so you can do the works that I do and even more. We find that as the disciples waited in Jerusalem for this empowerment of the Holy Spirit as promised by Jesus in Luke 24 and 49 and Acts 1, 4 through 8. We find that in chapter 2 of Acts, all of a sudden the promise happens. Pentecost happens. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit happens. Jesus promised his followers would do works he did and more. And like I said, he didn't want to leave us powerless. He didn't want to leave us in a place where we're just scratching our heads like, God, how are we supposed to do this? But no, he wanted to empower you. See, on the day of Pentecost, 
there were 120 disciples, we find this in Acts 1.15, who obeyed Jesus and waited in the upper room until the coming promise. Imagine waiting for a promise from God and you have no idea what it's going to look like. You have no idea. Because Pentecost had never happened before. I mean, yeah, they've celebrated Shavuot before. They knew what it meant to go into the temple and read the Torah and read the book of Ruth. And, and they knew what it meant to, to go into Jerusalem and bring their first fruits of the harvest. But all of a sudden, Jesus is telling them, go into the upper room and to tarry for 10 days until the promise of the Father comes. And I could just imagine they have no idea what they're waiting for. They have no idea what they're looking for because what God does is so different and so miraculous Here's the question that I have, though, and, and think about this for a second, is that for those 40 days that Jesus walked upon this earth, the scripture says that he appeared to over 500 disciples. In other words, people that had accepted him and are now following him. Why was there only 120 in that upper room and not all 500? To me, I have to sit and scratch my head on that and think about that for a, neck, for a second. Now, this is only speculation. Okay, this isn't Bible. This is speculation. But think about this for a second. How often, when God speaks to us about something, and because it's different, just different, God's not even really necessarily expecting us to change. He's just wanting to give us something different. Instead of waiting and tarrying in expectation of him, we go in back to our ritual. We go back to what we know. We go back to the familiar because we're comfortable there. When God's got something more and God's got something bigger and he wants, us to, wants to pour that out upon us and he wants to move upon us and he wants to do great things upon us. And my speculation is that 380 people went back to what they used to know. They went back to the familiar. Instead of trusting God for the unique, instead of trusting God for the spectacular and saying, God, I don't know what this is going to look like. God, I don't know what this is going to feel like. I don't know what, how this is going to happen. But Father, I'm going to trust you anyhow. And I thank God that there was at least 120 that went to that upper room. I'm glad that there was at least 120 that had the same experience of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on their life on that day of Pentecost. And, and, and the amazing thing is, is that when we go into the book of Acts and we see Peter, one of the most, I mean, you call him flaky if you want to. I think he's a lot like me sometimes. You know, his emotions run everywhere. You know, he cuts a ear off a soldier. I mean, Peter, Peter's just one of us when you really think about it. But when Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit, see, he had already had the Holy Spirit inside of him. He was just waiting for the empowerment, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But think about this. The very moment that he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, you never read through the book of Acts or anything about Peter, about his wishy-washiness in his faith anymore. He's pretty stable. Now, there are some things he struggled with in his humanity from time to time, but you never see him going from one extreme to the, to the next like he did when Jesus was walking the earth. What's even more phenomenal is that we have a guy who, who just denied Jesus Christ not even 50 days earlier, feeling guilty, feeling condemned, feeling just miserable for what he did. And, and we talked, you know, back, we talked several weeks ago about Jesus restoring Peter and, and what that looked like. And we know that Peter's response in the book of John was not the same response that, that Jesus was asking. Jesus was telling him, yeah, I love you like a brother when Jesus wanted full commitment. But we find that on the day of Pentecost when Peter is empowered, what happens? He stands up and preaches his first sermon and over 3,000 people get saved. Over 3,000. And the scripture doesn't count for men and women, so there could have been 10,000 as far as we know. But a, this thousands of people get saved as a result of that. After, 10, after these 10 days, God blesses them. And we find that he, he does this. See, this experience that, that marks several prophetic things in the life of, of the church at that time. First, God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai in the form of a fire. Well, we, when, we read the books of, when we read the book of Acts, when, the, when Pentecost happened and, and God first poured out his Holy Spirit, they, there was witnesses that said it looked like tongues of fire upon their head. Acts 2 and 2 said, describes a sound like a blowing of a violent wind. Throughout Scripture, God spoke to people through extreme winds. We, we find that not, not just here, but we find that at all kinds of different places. We also find Peter's proclamation of the gospel, and I just talked about that. It was a result of 3,000 people getting saved. See, this is in Luke's reference. When you look prophetically, 
There was over 3,000 people that rebelled against God at Mount Sinai at the giving of the Torah. In Exodus 32, 1 through 29, and the earth opened up and they, were di they died. So here we have another prophetic fulfillment. The celebration of Shavuot was the day Israel offered God the first fruits of their wheat harvest. We find that in Numbers 28 and 26. Since Shavuot is a celebration of Israel's first fruits, Paul also, we find this in Romans 8 and 23, Paul uses this relationship to show the Spirit gives the work of redemption, shows us the redemptive work the Holy Spirit has in our life. See, as Christians, Pentecost points to the fulfillment of the promises of of Shavuot, of Pentecost. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost is the evidence of Jesus' redemptive work and the affirmation of the new covenant that we have with him. It's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and fire that provides confidence in completing the task of the Great Commission that he's given to each and every one of us. See, some of us feel powerless when it comes to witnessing some of us feel powerless when it comes to prayer some of us feel powerless in the things that God has asked us to do and this morning you don't have to feel powerless you don't have to feel like you're alone and that God has left you alone to complete and to do those things that he's asked you to do he's promised the Holy Spirit in your life to empower you so that you can live the life that he wants you to fulfill matter of fact the Great Commission Jesus said this in Matthew 28, he said, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth, on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them with the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very ends of the earth. And I love how Paul says it. Paul says it this way in, in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5, and he's talking about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the message going, going forth. And you all may have heard me pray this before. He says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. On God's power. So bottom line, when it comes to Pentecost, and it comes about celebration of Pentecost, and it comes about living out Pentecost in the scriptures, it's not about a denomination, it's not about a particular church, it's not even necessarily about a particular experience. The celebration of Pentecost is the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church so that you and I and every one of us can go out and win this world to Jesus Christ. Pentecost is about the harvest. Pentecost is about seeing people that are lost, that do not know Jesus Christ, come to him for the first time and repent of their sins. When we, look at, when we look through the message of Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, when we look at the message of all the apostles throughout the book of Acts, there was one message that was said over and over again. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and be baptized. Repent and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Repent and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. What, what is the common thing there? Repent. Why? Because they were after one thing. They wanted to see the harvest. So when we, go, when we go into Pentecost on June 4th, and you might say, well, you kind of did that on purpose. You're exactly right. I did. <laughs> when we go into Pentecost on June 4th, and we have water baptism, and we have baby dedications, and we're doing these things as a celebration of Pentecost, we're doing something that I believe that is also in the order of what God's Word has taught us about first fruits, about winning the harvest. Amen? Because we want to see the harvest won. See, Jesus left the disciples with this in Mark 16, 17 through 18. And to me, this is pretty amazing because most of this I've never seen or done or experienced. And maybe one day I will, and I hope and pray I will. But he says this, he says, These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt, uh, hurt them at all. They will place their hands upon the sick, and they will get well. What is Jesus telling them in Mark 16? 
He's saying that when you got the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life and you tag that with a faith in Jesus Christ and what he's able to do through you, you're going to have signs, miracles, and wonders following you. Following you. Why? Because Jesus knew that it was going to take, in some instances, signs, miracles, and wonders to win the harvest to him. And I don't know about you, but I'm open game for whatever God wants to do through me. I'm open game to see whatever it takes to see the harvest come in. When you, when you say, and you might say, well, you know, we don't see a lot of miracle signs and wonders in our church. I'm not saying miracle signs and wonders aren't for the church. I'm not saying that at all. Please don't, please don't mistake what I'm about ready to say. But when I look at the Gospels and I look at the book of Acts, the majority of the miracle signs and wonders happened in the harvest field. In the harvest field. And when the harvest field came in, those miracles and signs and wonders happened in the body as well. Pentecost is about the harvest. And I tell you what, I'm ready for the harvest. I'm ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in such a powerful way. How does God want to show up? I don't know. You're saying, well, you're just a pastor. You're supposed to know. I don't know God's mind all the time. And sometimes I don't want to know God's mind because I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> but I do know this. He's faithful. He's faithful. And I believe he's pouring it out and I believe he's speaking to people and he's changing lives. He's doing mighty, mighty things. And I cannot wait to see the end result. Amen. Father, I thank you this morning that you thought of every single detail. Every single detail our lives you thought of every single detail the things that you fulfilled the biblical prophecies you fulfilled it's just amazing to me but father i thank you this morning that that you kept your promise you, you told us over and over you are not going to leave us orphans but that you were going to send the holy spirit and the holy spirit was going to lead us and guide us he's going to empower us he's going to instruct us and so, Father, I thank you this morning for your promise of the Holy Spirit. And, Father, as we go into these next couple of weeks, Father, and as we talk about the Spirit and fire, Father, I ask that your Spirit would just show up among us in a special way, in a way we've never experienced before. Father, I pray that that same expectancy of those 120 would be in us. Father, that we not be like the 380, but Lord, that we be like that 120 that is in that upper room, that we're tarrying, that we're before you, and we're saying, God, whatever it is, whatever it looks like, we want it, we're ready for it. God, show up and do what you do best. Father, we want to see our community one to you, and we know that the only way that that's going to happen is through your Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. So Father, I pray as we go out this week, and we witness to people as we go out this week. I pray that you bring divine appointments into our, into our lives that we can witness the gospel to. And that, Father, that we would see the harvest come in. Father, as we prepare for Pentecost on June 4th, Father, I'm believing for a harvest to come in. That we're going to see the first fruits, people we've been praying for, people that we've been believing you for, for years, would come to know you. Father, I thank you this morning for who you are, and I give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.